Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Today we're looking at a data set of women's international football results. And uh, basically, it's um, a bunch of uh, games, international football games. Uh, we have the home team and away team, the scores of those teams, and uh, a vi some other features about the game. And what we're going to try to do is predict um, if the home team wins. And we don't actually have a column for this, but what we can do is just check if um, if the home score is greater than the away score, then we'll consider that a win. So we would uh, we're not really checking because uh, we'd be including we'd be including ties in a loss. It's not really a loss. It's just did they win or not. All right, so let's get into it. Um, task for today. Given data about women's football games, let's try to predict whether the home team of a given game will win or not. And I have um, some libraries we're importing here, NumPy, Pandas, Plotly Express for visualization, Standard Scalar from sklearn, and the train test split function also from sklearn, both for pre-processing. And we're going to use TensorFlow to make our predictions. So I'll go ahead and import those, and then I will load in the data using the uh, pandas read CSV function. And I can go and get the file path right over here. Just click copy file path, paste it in, and I can take a look at the data. And we have 4,000 rows, so a decent amount, and uh, nine columns. So um, what we're going to do is reformat this a little bit. Like I said, we're going to get um, uh, a target column by comparing these two. And then we're going to also extract uh, year and month columns out of the date. So uh, let's start pre-processing. And you know, actually before that, I can include this up here, data.info. We'll get a little bit of information. And we can notice that there's actually uh, no null values, right? Everything is non-null for every column. And we only have two numerical columns. So that means we're going to have to do some serious encoding on all the others. All right, so, um, oh, also we noticed that a Boolean column can easily be converted into a numerical column. So for our purposes, we can consider it numerical. Um, all right, so, uh, I wouldn't exactly say pre-processing, although this is a sense of, in a way, pre-processing, I'm actually gonna call it feature engineering. And we'll say and target creation. So notice we have this date column right here, and the year is stored in the first four characters of the date column. The month is stored in the fifth to seventh characters in the date column. Um, well, wait, this is four, five, six, seven, the sixth and seventh characters. So if I apply a lambda function to this, it takes in some x, which would be a given date, and we return x uh, indexed from 0 to 4. That would should just give us the years. And sure enough, it does, because it's saying our chop off the date uh, just so that we're just getting the 0 to 4, four slice. Similarly, if I indexed from, well, let me uh, first just show the original thing again. If I index from 5, which is right here, to seven, which is right here, we should get just the month. And there we go. So with this, we can create two new columns. Uh, one from zero to four, and one from five to seven, and call them year and month, respectively. And then when we're done, we can drop the original date column. So data equals data dot drop. Uh, I don't have to include this actually, just date. Access one. All right, now if we look at data, we now have this new year and month column already in numerical form. Um, and we don't have the date column anymore. Okay. So now what can we do? Okay. We want to get a target column that is the, um, it shows the result of um, the game. But 
uh, if we take a look, so we have home score and we have away score. Now I'm going to compare them in some way. Um, I can check how many are equal and you can see we have at least one, this one right here, but I'm going to sum over that to see uh, the total number of, of equal uh, scores. And there's 574 of them. So essentially what we have is 574 ties. Uh, if we check how many are less than, we have 1400 losses for the home team. And we check greater, we have 2189 wins. So um, notice that 2189 is roughly 50% of uh, the total number of examples. So uh, if we consider, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try to predict if the home team won or not. We're not trying to predict if they won or lost. Uh, so a zero doesn't mean lost, it just means didn't win. All right, so what we'll do is if we take this thing, it's true and false. And if we say as type numpy.int, it will just turn it to ones and zeros. And so that's our column right there. So data, we can say uh, home victory equals. And then when we're done, we can drop the original home score. I'll do it this way. Home score and away score. Because if we use those as features, we'd be cheating because we created the target column from those features. Um, so access one, and that will be the new data. All right, now if we look at data, we now have our, uh, our, our target column right here at the end and we no longer have those score columns, and we also have the year and month uh, ready to go. So now, we're, one last thing is let's turn neutral into, uh, into zeros and ones. So data uh, equals data, no, no, data sub neutral equals data sub neutral dot as type numpy.int. So we're converting it from Boolean to uh, to uh, numeric. And so now we just have to one hot encode these. And you can see we need one hot encoding right away because there's um, at least three unique values in every single one. Um, and they don't take on any sort of order. They're all uh, nominal. It's a nominal feature. So um, these five need to be one hot encoded. So I'll say encoding, and yeah, I'll just make that a header. We're going to make a function for encoding, which will just be called one hot encode, and it's going to take in a data frame, a list of columns, and a list of prefixes to use for the uh, dummy columns for each column. So we're going to start by creating a copy of our data frame. And then we're going to iterate through each column in the list of columns we specified. So for column in columns, um, but actually we want to also get the prefix for a given column. So note that if we have some list, one, two, three, uh, we'll call that X, and another list we'll call Y, four, five, six. Um, let's, let's, if we zip them, so zip X, Y, and we view it as a list, you can see it's actually paired off element-wise uh, each um, the, of the elements between the two lists. So if you have two lists of the same length, you can pair them into tuples using zip. So one goes to four, two goes to five, three goes to six. So that's what I'm doing here um, when I say zip columns and prefixes. Because now, by zipping the columns and prefixes, that allows me to index twice uh, with two iterators, um, column and prefixes, prefix. So for column prefix pair in the zipped version of columns and prefixes, we can now say, well, we can make a dummies uh, data frame using pandas.getDummies. And pandas.getDummies basically takes 
a column, uh, data sub, let's use, uh, why don't we use a tournament? Tournament. And it will return a new data frame, um, except all the unique values that were in tournament originally have now become columns. And for a given example, let's say example three, originally had a euro as its value for tournament. Now example three will have zeros in all these new columns, but uh, well, we can't actually see euro here, but euro's in there, it'll have a one. Let me get a better example. Uh, example 4,158 for tournament has uh, Tournoi de France. And if we look at uh, 4,158 over here, there's a one in the corresponding column and a zero in all others. Okay, so with uh, pandas.getDummies, we will um, get the dummies for a specific column that we're iterating in this uh, list of columns that we specified. And uh, actually, I should also note that with, this, um, with these dummies, you can include a prefix. Let's say um, tournament. Now tournament will just get appended to the beginning of every um, every column that's created for the dummies. This prevents us from having duplicate columns because, for example, um, I can't see any here, but we're sure to have, uh, oh wait, here, yeah. Okay, we have Italy here and Italy here. If we one hot encoded both of these, we'd have two Italy columns, one for each uh, original column. So by doing the prefix, we can uh, prevent having duplicate column names. All right, so we're making this dummies uh, data frame, and we'll include the prefix uh, as the one in the zipped version. So they go side by side, column and prefix. So we use column and prefix to make this uh, dummies. And then we'll use pandas.concat to concatenate the original data frame and the dummies. And we're concatenating along the column axis, axis one. And when we're done, we can just drop the original column from which we created the dummies, because we don't need it anymore. And we'll return data frame. Okay. So what we'll do now is just use this function on all of the ones we need. And I wrote it in such a way that we can, um, we can just call it once and pass in a list. So not one hot, one hot in code. All right, so we're, do, we're performing it on data and the columns we want are these ones, right? So I could just paste this in Although it would be messy, I have to clean it up. Okay. And then uh, we're going to specify the prefixes that match up. So how about home, away, turn, city, and country. All right. And uh, so I'll run that. Now if we look at data, um, we now have all these one hot columns, uh, in fact, 1500 of them. Uh, and we have the original columns right at the beginning. So we're hoping that these, um, this large number of new features can help us in predicting the winner of a game. <clears throat> and it's good to keep in mind that uh, we're never predicting something about games, especially the outcome of a game. It's, it's very good to get uh, a metric close to 70%. If we can get 70%, that's actually performing quite well. And this changes for each game. It's not always 70%, but um, you would never be able to get 90 or 100% prediction accuracy uh, when dealing with games because if you can, it's not a fair game, right? <laughs> The game should be some somewhat random and somewhat fair that it could go either way regardless of the uh, scenario. Um, however, if, if of course we were able to provide the finishing scores, which we removed from the original data set, um, then we could get a higher accuracy. But uh, let's just aim for 70, okay? That's a sort of baseline measurement. <clears throat> 
in my experience. Okay, so um, now we have the data in fully numerical form. And we can go on to splitting and scaling. So I'm going to create an X and a Y. Y is just going to be uh, data sub uh, home victory. So it's a 1 if it's a home victory. And otherwise, it's a, it's a 0. Now I'll just actually use the locate, loc function. And x equals data dot drop home victory. All right. Uh, so x looks like the data set without the home victory column. So we have one less column. And y will just be the home victory column. All right, so I'm going to scale it. I'm going to make a scalar object using the standard scalar that we imported from sklearn. And x is going to be scalar.fitTransform x. And this, um, just so that we can visualize this a little easier, I'm going to turn this into a data frame since the fit transform function actually returns a numpy array. And I'm going to set the columns equal to the old column names so that we can see that more nicely. So now if I look at x, uh, you can see the whole thing has been scaled so that each column has a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. And uh, it's a bit, I mean, a lot of these are one hot columns, so yeah. Okay, so everything is scaled. Everything's ready to go into our model. Uh, we're going to split once more. X train, X test. Y train, Y test. And we're going to use the train test split function here to split X and Y into these four new categories for a train test, a train set and a test set. So we're going to specify a train size of 70% and we'll include a random state as well. Uh, it's going to be any number. Why, let's just pick some random number. 67 sounds good. All right, so this is training. And now we're going to use a TensorFlow neural network to try to train. And the reason I pick a neural network here is because uh, neural networks tend to perform very well when you have a lot of columns, uh, as opposed to some other uh, methods of classification. So let's take a look at the shape of our x and also the mean of our y. So this is the skew of our classes, essentially. Um, they are about balanced, 50%, so uh, it's pretty good. Uh, and for our x shape, this is the number of features we have for a given example. So with this data, I'm going to construct our model. So we're going to create an input layer. So inputs equals tf.keras.input, and we'll pass in the shape of our feature vector, which will be a vector of length 1502. And our first hidden layer will be a dense layer, tf.keras.layers.dense, and we'll include uh, 64 activations and an activation function of ReLU. So these are just the, the, the standard way of doing it, and we can always tweak it later if we need to. Um, then we'll do the, an identical hidden layer after that. So we're doing two hidden layers, but this one will pass an X. And then for outputs, uh, we're going to have a hidden layer as well. Uh, uh, sorry, not hidden layer, a uh, dense layer. But it's only going to output one value, which will be the probability estimate for the positive class. So this is the one value it's outputting is the um, percent chance that a, the home team will win. And we'll give that an activation of sigmoid, which will be, uh, which will give us a value between 0 and 1 to allow for probability estimation. Alright, and we'll create a model with tf.keras.model, um, passing in the inputs and outputs. And then we'll compile that model. So we need to specify an optimizer. We'll use Atom here, uh, a loss function, which we'll use binary cross entropy, and some metrics. And I could just use accuracy because we have a pretty good um, balance of classes, but I'm also just going to include 
uh, AUC. So we have two ways of evaluating our model. So AUC is the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, um, and it provides a more rounded way of seeing how our model is performing. Uh, basically, it takes into account all the different uh, classes. So within each class, in this case two classes, um, evaluates performance within each class and then also uh, across different classification thresholds. So do you choose to classify y equals 1 when the probability estimate is over 0.5 or 0.6 or 0.7? That's a classification threshold. AUC takes into account all possible thresholds. All right, so uh, we will now uh, fit our model, uh, but we have to specify a batch size and epochs. We'll specify it outside of the function so that we can reference it later if we need to. And we can, let's just train for 50 epochs. And we'll store our model's fit history in history variable, model.fit. So we're fitting on the train set, x train, y train. And we'll include a validation split of 20%. This will allow us to see our model's progress uh, after each epoch. And then we will give it a batch size equal to the one we specified, and number of epochs also equal to the amount we specified. All right, so let's run that. And while that goes, I'm going to now create a plotly plot of how our uh, performance went across the epochs. So fig is going to be px.line, and we're drawing values from history.history. .history. So here's history. Uh, it has a attribute called history, which is a dictionary that maps a metric to the values of that metric across the epochs. So uh, the y, which is the um, what we're plotting on the y-axis is going to be the loss um, metric from y and val loss from y. So essentially, the y is going to plot uh, the sorry this thing, right, and this thing in the same plot in a line plot. Then we'll give it some labels. X will become epoch and y can become loss. And title here is uh, loss over time. All right, so let's take a look. So um, it looks like our training loss continues to go down as we train the model, which is to be expected. And our validation loss, uh, it looks like it actually is just going up straight from the start. It never goes down, which means uh, we're not really ever learning to generalize on new examples. It's saying that uh, basically the way that the weights were randomly initialized is uh, better, um, it better at making guesses that way than with any sort of training going on. So this is an indication that we could be overfitting our model uh, because we give it a large number of dense uh, units here. It's not necessarily the case, but we give it a lot of freedom. And um, so we could one thing we can try is just lowering the number here. So this will make our model simpler and allow us to uh, not, not to try so hard in a sense. So I'll try retraining that and see if it, in, if it affects the outcome at all. And I'll run this when it's done. I'll also like to run, uh, I'd like, okay. Um, so it, it looks like it went down a little, but not much of an improvement. Um, let me try lowering it to 16. And I'm just trying things here. And then I also like to duplicate this graph, but I'm gonna do it for a, uh, the AUC measurement instead of the loss. So val AUC as well. AUC and AUC. All right. Okay, so it looks like it's dipping a little more now. 
Um, but it's really, like, if we zoom in on this, it's hardly going down. Hardly at all. So, it looks like, um, yeah, like, we should not train for many epochs if we are going to train at all. Uh, and the AUC looks like, it, this is very interesting, right? The AUC actually maximizes around here, like so epoch 6 or something. But at epoch 6 on the loss curve, it's gone up some. So this this is because, um, well, it could be a variety of reasons. But one reason uh, could be the model is getting better at classifying a large range of games. But it's getting worse at classifying the ones it was already classifying badly, if that makes sense. Uh, because we use this loss binary cross entropy, we're essentially um, getting a value for how bad a prediction is. And once you classify um, incorrectly, you can still do worse on that on that value. Like you can say you can get it wrong, but then you can get it really wrong, and you can get it even more wrong. And so when that happens, the loss goes up, but the AUC does not go down because we still haven't changed whether or not that was classified correctly or not. It's still incorrectly classified. So the AUC only sees classifications, whereas the loss sees this like uh, continuous measurement of how good, how well we're doing. So that's why we can get a higher value here while this is still going up. So what if we try training for like six epochs? You know, I should also note, uh, we should probably see what the performance is on the test set before we do any more tweaking. So X test, Y test. So we have a AUC of about 66 percent. Uh, oh, it's not percent exactly. 64 percent, 65 percent accuracy and AUC of 0.67, I guess. Uh, so this is okay, but let's see if we can get it higher. So um, one thing we can try is, okay, well, stopping at around here, because this is when, before the loss gets really high, we still have the same amount of AUC, same sort of AUC value, and that looks like it's around epoch 6 or 7, so we'll do 7, try training for a shorter time before it has a chance to overfit, and you can see our val AUC hasn't had a chance to go down yet. Um, the loss still is going up a little, but the AUC should have converged to a maximum. And we can check, uh, okay, well, our AUC actually went down. Now, another thing to note, the length of our test set is important. Okay, this is a decent number of test examples, so I don't think we have to worry about that. Sometimes this can jump around a lot because we don't have too many examples to make, like, a to draw percentage from. Like, if we had 10 here, imagine, uh, one misclassification in the test set and your uh, accuracy value has changed by 10% ten, ten so but this looks good so let's see what we can do to get this up okay I'm gonna try um, bumping this up again I don't know how this will affect it but I'd like to see how it affects the overall end result actually I want to train for a little longer here 25 epochs let's do that um, and looks like we have a peak AUC around this area, probably around the same area. Um, so the loss is going up again. The AUC peaks around here, I think. So we'll do, we'll just do it for seven epochs again. Okay. Right. So it converged. We'll evaluate, and we have six seven. So better. Um, looks like that maybe we should not have lowered this in the first place. We'd also like to uh, include a callback function. Well, this is something we can do. We don't have to. Um, and I'd like to see how it perform, how it affects the results. Basically, it's a callback function that uh, reduces the learning rate, so reduce LR, on plateau. So when the loss stop starts decreasing at a like, decreasing rate, then we reduce the learning rate to allow us to converge more easily. And actually, what this allows us to do is train for more epochs without overfitting as hard. So, I don't know how this will affect it. We're just going to see. See, it looks like our our, uh, law, our AUC is not going down very much. And it looks like our loss stopped going up as quickly. In this case, it converged to a straight line almost. 
and here we get uh, roughly the same value. Hmm. So that, but that was on 20 epochs. So let's see what is the maximum value you see. NumPy dot argmax uh, of history dot history sub val auc, and that means epoch eight. So if we took the max, we'd get the actual maximum AUC. But if we do argmax, we can get the epoch for which we have the, the AUC. And this epoch uh, array is actually shifted uh, starting to start from zero. So this should become nine for nine epochs. We'll see if we can get the maximum performance from this model. All right, so. All right, let's see this, 0.667. Okay, so we're seeing marginal improvements. Um, we can train this for 20 again, see if we get higher. There's also an element of randomness here that will affect our model's performance. Uh, let's see how that goes. 6.8, okay. So about 6.6 six to 6.8, six um, not too bad. Like I said, we're aiming for 70 at most, Probably, if we get more than that, there's probably something wrong with the game, or we have like uh, extremely good predictors in our in our futures. Uh, but this is all this is pretty good, you know, especially considering um, the data we're given. We're really only given like the city it's played in, the country it's played in, neutral. What the neutral column is a uh, column indicating whether the match was played at a neutral venue. So this is like. Uh, are the fans cheering for one team over the other? So uh, that could affect it as well. But looks like we got decent performance on our model, and I guess that'll do it for today. So uh, I guess that sums up the video. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell and leave any comments in, sec in the section below that you might have for suggestions for the channel or anything else. So uh, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.